Well, we were closed last Sunday, and we're here now this morning. Uh, last Sunday, I was going to um, preach on the message that the Lord laid on my heart. Jesus paid it all. But this morning, God had changed the, the avenue, the method of preaching this, this morning. And uh, we're going to um, talk about a, a, a subject or a matter that is extremely popular today. What's, what's today? Today's Groundhog Day. Today is... Today is Joe's birthday and, and uh, everyone's anniversary. I mean, there's just so much going on today. But, but today, the calendar year has been set for Super Bowl Sunday. So I think I got a picture up here this morning. Uh, this, this morning, the message is going to be called, What Are You Fighting For? So I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor. neighbor. Come on, say it like you mean it, neighbor. Neighbor. What are you fighting for? What are you fighting for? Today, we're going to be in the book of Timothy, 1st Timothy, chapter 6, verse 12. But just a little insight about Super Bowl Sunday. Here it says, all across America, millions will gather for these enormous Super Bowl parties before sitting down in front of the TV for the championship game. How many of you are going to watch the Super Bowl this afternoon? All right. How many of you are just going to go to parties and eat up the food? <laughs> I've got four. Right? Amen. Ain't no shame in that. Ain't no shame in that. Now, for those who know me, I, I'm not a sports fanatic. I'm not a sports guru. I really don't know anything about sports. Now, one time, I, I did, I did um, football camp. Is my mom still here? I think maybe she stepped out. I did football camp, and it was for one week. And I didn't make the whole week. <laughs> I made the first two days. There was this big man they put in front of me. Because I'm, you know, I'm a small guy, right? So <laughs> they, they match you up to this person. And this guy was is much bigger than me. I was I was in eighth grade at the time, Bob, and this guy was a high school. Bob Byron. You might know Bob Byron. Anyways, Bob Byron and I, we, we were lined up. You know, they tell you to get down and line up. Well, Bob Byron, Bob Byron hit me so hard. I remember this just, just like yesterday. He hit me so hard that the whole left side of my body went numb. And I said, forget that. <laughs> I, I turned in my helmet and I, and I just left. But football is becoming the Americans, uh, America's top sport. Now, here's a little numbers before we actually start getting into the method, because what I want to talk about, you know, today the world is going to celebrate Super Bowl. But in reality, the fact of the matter is, we are always in a spirit bowl. Drake. Drake. Right. 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 picture? Spirit bowl. There we go. There's always... Today, there's been two teams that have fought the good fight of faith, that the, the, you know, have fought to the end, and now they're going to be fighting against each other. But think about that. That's one day out of here they celebrate this big championship. Now, I know that there's a series of games that they have to get to the Super Bowl, but you and I are in a spiritual battle, a spiritual bowl, every day of our lives. That's right. That's right. When you and I wake up, the battle begins. So this morning, just a few facts about the Super Bowl, and we're going to move on to the spiritual part about this. Four million dollars will be spent for at least a 30-second commercial. So a Super Bowl commercial for at least 30 seconds is going to cost four million dollars. The most expensive ticket for the game bought legally, you like that, bought legally, will cost $50,000. Today, there will be 14 billion hamburgers that are served. That's a lot of beef. 6% of Americans will call off work tomorrow because they're sick. Either of the game or something they consumed or something. <laughs> this is the third time in the Super Bowl history both nicknames are animals. So the C Seattle Seahawks and then the Denver Broncos, okay? 92,000 will be given to the winning team as a bonus per player. Per player. 
$92,000 will be given to each player if they win the Super Bowl. That's a lot of money. We need to invite them to church, amen? <laughs> All right, uh, last, last two one. 5% of this, now this is pretty, this is shady. Is Alexis in here? All right. 5% of Americans said they would miss their child's birth for the Super Bowl. <laughs> Joe's getting it over there. Yeah. All right, the Super Bowl is the second, second highest day of food consumed in the United States of America after Thanksgiving. The Super Bowl is a big deal to people. I mean, they really, they spend some time prepping and they start preparing for this and they send out invites, come to my house, we're gonna have a Super Bowl party, we're gonna, we're gonna get, our, you know, get our seats up and you know, we're gonna prepare for this. But how often do you and I prepare for our spiritual goal? I mean, think about it. I mean, here we know football teams, there's two opponents, two teams, and they're fighting against each other for one thing, and that's the championship. Well, the same thing for good and evil. There are two people, there are two opponents, good and evil, and they're fighting for the same thing. And that same thing is souls. Satan is working just as hard to get souls as the church is today. So the church is supposed to be fighting for souls. We're supposed to be getting the good news out there. We're supposed to be telling people, hey, Jesus is alive. He's your Savior. Why don't you come to know him? But we are failing on that aspect. The churches are starting to dwindle down. And there's several different reasons. I'm going to talk about four characteristics this morning that make a great football team. And then I started using my spiritual imagination. Well, what are the top four characteristics that it will take for us to become a great church? And that's kind of what the, we're, we're going to talk about this morning. But if you have your Bibles, let's get a look at 1 Timothy chapter 6 really quick. It's going to be up in the big wall as well. Okay? It says, fight the good fight of faith. Tell somebody to fight. 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 Tell me your neighbor and say fight. 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 You fight over the... You fight over the TV remote at home. <coughs> you fight over the bank account. You fight, anybody fight over the bathroom at home? The Bible tells us, fight the good fight of faith. We need to fight for our faith. We need to fight for the championship. We need to fight believing that God is on our side and that when we share the good news, that people will come to know Jesus. Amen? Amen. That's what we need to be fighting for. It says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you are called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. This is simply saying here, church, it's time to fight the good fight of faith. These football people are getting paid out there and they're, they were being trained, they're being prepared, they're being equipped to fight against the opponent so that they can win the championship so they can get their 92,000 bonus at the end of the game. Church, we are the same concept. We as the body of Christ need to fight the good fight of faith so that there are people that are dying and going to hell out there will come to know Jesus Christ. Sure. Amen, Well, Somebody say amen this morning. Wake amen. it up. Amen. Church, we have to get excited and motivated. Think about the time when you didn't know Jesus and somebody was excited to share Christ with you and what? look what happened. You accepted Jesus Christ and he has carried you throughout the way. Amen. Man. So God has been good, and the scripture tells us, find the good fight of faith. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. So let's, let's pray before we go farther. God, we thank you this morning, first of all, for being our God and for loving us, and for being on our side, for being our, for being our God. And, and, and Lord, just, we ask that you would just be, be at the service this morning, God. We pray that the Spirit will move and, and it will awaken souls and spirits this morning, God. We pray that as, as we're thinking about whatever those distractions are this morning, that they would be diminished and that God, you will bring an alertness, a sense of urgency to the message this morning that we need to fight the good fight of faith, that we are in a spiritual bowl, we are in a spiritual battle, and that we as a church, we as God's people need to be prepared for what comes our way. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Amen, amen. So, there are four top characteristics I want to share with you. Uh, this past week, I was talking to a coach at, at my job. There was a, he coaches a, a team, a 
uh, football team, and I asked them, I said, Coach, I said, what is it, what are the top four characteristics, or what are the top four things that as a coach you look for in your people, in your team? And this is the first one he gave to me. He says, becoming a great football team, team first. He says, team first. And I said, well, you have to explain that to me because I'm not a football guy. I don't really know all the fun, you know, all the doctrine or whatever the football. But simply, team first. <coughs> and this is what he said. You won't find a great team that has players who are playing for themselves. It must be a team effort to be the best. So I began to use my spiritual imagination, and this is what came up to me. If we're going to be a great church, this is what we have to have. Number one is unity. Yes. Right. Yes. We have to be unified in Christ. If we're going to succeed in anything that we do as a team, we have to be unified. Because listen, our opponent, Satan, is always trying to bring discord in the church. Satan is always trying to bring tactics to tear down the church. And it starts with people. Miscommunications. It starts with people who have arrogant issues. It's with people who think that they're in charge when they're not in charge. You have those type of disunified things that take place in the church. And if we're going to succeed as a body of Christ, and if we're going to succeed as New Hope Church of God, we have to realize that we have to be unified. Unified in everything that we say and do throughout this building and our church doctrine. We have to be unified, understanding that God blesses special people with special gifts, and that they have to be lined up in a special way so that they can then succeed and accomplish the mission that Christ has set before them. So unity, the scripture here is found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16. He makes the whole body fit perfectly. As each part does its own special works, it helps the other parts grow so the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. That's the scripture saying, you know what, if you're going to make this thing work, if the church is going to succeed, you have to be unified. You have to be unified in your thinking. You have to be unified in your teaching. You have to be unified in your, in your church leadership. You have to be unified what's taking place on Sunday morning. Unity is the key that's going to bring us together and make us stronger. They say a church that prays together what? Together. A church that eats together what? Gets back together. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? But think about it, when you do things corporately, what happens? We strengthen each other up, we build off of each other's characteristics, we build off of each other's groups, we build off of each other's leadership, and that's going to what make us stronger for the kingdom of God. But if we have cliques here and there, and we have people that's acting over here and over here, there's gaps between them, and Satan will get involved. And he will destroy the church. But let's not give Satan all the credit. It happens with us. We get to a point where we start to get so big that we overpower authority. We overlook who God has appointed. Again, let's use the game concept, the football concept. God is our coach. The pastors are his people that he aligns, and the leaders are the people that he puts in position to help shepherd the flock and to get us all unified and to do things together. Unity is what's going to help our church to advance and to grow and to do greater things for the kingdom of God. I certainly don't want to come into a dysfunctional church and get caught up in all that. I certainly just want to come into a place where we can come together and know that when we come on Sunday morning, we're going to be worshiping one person and one person only, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. Unity is what we need. If the team is going to succeed, we have to be unified. That means we're going to fit perfectly together. Just like the scripture says, he makes the whole body fit perfectly together. God knew where the big toe needed to go on the body. God knew where the nose needed to go on the body. If those things were backwards, it would not function properly. Your, your foot would be used as a vacuum cleaner. 
Think about it. We have to unify, and we have to allow Christ to be the one that unifies and puts the body of Christ together, and again, ultimately fighting for the same purpose, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. The second thing, becoming a great football team, the guy said, was fundamentally sound. Having to know what the, what the terminology is for football, knowing your boundaries, knowing where, knowing when a flag is going to be thrown. You have to be fundamentally sound. You have to know exactly what's going to take place during the game. When the coach calls a call, they have to know and be aware that this is what this is mean. You don't have time to go to a dictionary and look up these words. This is what he says. He says the casual football fan might not appreciate just how important all these qualities are. But in a close game, listen, but in a close game, it is often the difference between the winning and the losing team. When you have a winning team, they know their calls. They know they're ahead of the game. When you have a losing team, the losing team is going to start coming up with some new tactics at the end. And they're going to start trying to bring the game back. Right? Okay, so they're gonna they're gonna huddle up, they're gonna take all their timeouts, they're gonna get together, they're gonna talk about things, they're gonna see how they can get this win, they're gonna see how they can become team first, unified mindset, mindset mentality, they're gonna see exactly how they're gonna do this and how they're gonna bring this game back. They know their boundaries, they know the terminologies, they know their plan of action. Well, if we're gonna become a great church, not only do we have to have unity. But secondly, we have to know God's word. We have to know what God's word is. Joshua 1.8 says, Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night, and you will be sure to obey everything written. Only then you will prosper and succeed in all that you do. God's word is our game book. It's our game plan. It's the instruction manual to life. This book that we have in our hands that we use is used to fight the good fight of faith. It tells us exactly how to win the battle. We also know that the battle's already won. Jesus Christ paid it all. He's on the cross and now he's resurrected, sitting at the right hand of the Father. And when that day he decides to return, the battle has been won. But while we're here on this earth, we still have a battle to fight. We still have things that we need to accomplish. We still need to come together and know God's word. Simply, if you're defeated in life, there's going to be a scripture that will come to your mind and it will encourage you. The Bible says, hide the word of God in your heart. Are we really reading God's word? Do we, as a church, are we fundamentally sound in our doctrine?